safety protocols that, we, that we've had to put in place. We're trying to be aware and, and, and be respectful of that, so thank you for that. Um, and I would like to, just a couple other thank yous. Thank you to um, Pastor Michael. Actually, if you don't realize how much work it takes to produce um, what he did for 14 weeks video-wise and audio, um, I've done small projects before and nothing the caliber that he did with the, the video. So if you're able to partake in those sermons, and the messages online, um, just maybe shoot them a thank you later. Um, that's a lot of a lot of time, a lot of work. So excellent quality. I thought it was great. Fantastic. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. So um, I know myself, along with a lot of people, I had conversations with. Th this season brought up a lot of chances for us to talk with people outside of our church. It just seemed like people I work with, um, and, and just other people came in contact, told them about our services, or people said, "Oh, I checked out the." You know, I saw the, the songs or something on your, your website in the, in the sermon. That was really neat, just to see that those connections happening that maybe wouldn't in a normal in a normal three months or whatever. Um, so thank you uh, for that, for everybody, for your prayers. Um, our church is officially 200 years old as of yesterday, the bicentennial, I believe that's the right term. So that's fantastic. Um, and also a thank you today. Happy Father's Day to all the dads that are here. Um, one of my children got me the shirt. Says my favorite kid bought me the shirt with my own money, <laughs> so I had to wear it today. But also, uh, thank you to Gene Olson, um, just organizing uh, a little sweet treat gift for dads on your way out. Please don't forget that. And also, just an announcement about the offering today. There will be no um, official offering in the sanctuary, but the, um, the offering plates are in the back. You can do that just on the way out if you're prepared to do so. so. All right. Well, in that spirit of I guess joy. Let's let's open in a word of prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you. It's great to be back. Uh, we, it, it was hard being away from this type of fellowship in person, face to face, seeing people not on a, a TV screen or FaceTime or phone, uh, but to be together, just to um, hear people's voices in person, to just to see in their eyes that joy to be back together. Thank you that we're not forsaking that, but we're here today. Um, thank you for the protocols that we have in place just to keep people as safe as possible and to reduce risk. Uh, but Lord, it's good and we should gather together. And we're thankful that we have that liberty, that, that freedom in this country to do that. Um, may we never take it for granted. Uh, and Lord, this morning, just as we um, turn our thoughts to you again, and we'll be blessed by the message that you'll, that you'll give us through Pastor Michael. Thank you for his preparation. Um, and God, thank you for all who can be here today. As again, we lift our praises to you. Um, as always, we can bring our, our concerns to you. And most of all, we just our thanksgiving to you. And bless our time today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we will sing one hymn today, hymn number eight. Right in the beginning of the hymnal, if you have that, we can stand and sing. To God be the glory. William is ready to sing today.
All right, well, good morning. How's everybody doing? All right, I'm seeing people in the balcony down here. This is great. Awesome to see you all. And, uh, and it's Father's Day. I don't know if you've gotten to talk with your dad today. Uh, hopefully you did. I was texting my dad early this morning and just uh, thanking him uh, for being a great dad and, and just the things that I feel like he gave me to be a dad to my girls. And then he told me, well, you know, Michael, a lot of those things came from your grandfather and his grandfather. And so it's not just about Father's Day, but it's about grandfathers and great-grandfathers and those who have gone before us. And if they spent their life following Jesus, then that gave us a template and an ability to uh, follow that um, going forth. And so what I'd like to do is, if you are dad in here, you can stand. And I'd like to just go ahead and stand after your dad. And uh, yeah, let's give him a hand. Uh, when I got up this morning and uh, was working on getting ready and the, the girls started moving around, I always go into their room uh, when they first wake up and uh, I'm smiling and say, good morning girls. And Alana, with a big smile on her face, she looks at me and she says, today is church day. Aww. And so I said, well, if we didn't get anything else right, then we got that. And, and uh, she said, we get to go back to the building of church, right? And fortunately for us, you know, the church is not just a place. And we're blessed that we have a place to come to, uh, but it's about more than that, right? That's how we've been able to gather afar, gather online for so many weeks. And I'm just thankful that we've been able to do that. And I want to thank you for being faithful in that area to do that at home and, and be consistent in that. Okay? And so for fathers today, I thought it was interesting. We were looking at 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. And I want to just read the last few verses for us because I think Dad's really set the trajectory for us uh, as we go about life and do things. And for the family, it's really foundational that they would live in this way. And it says this in verse 7, For God has not called us for impurity but holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And as a reminder and a sweet note for my wife, we were coming over here and I was getting ready uh, the Holy Spirit is present, right, inside of each and every one of us, and especially for dads. We've got to do that, that sweet thing, right, of listening to the Holy Spirit and how we lead our families. And if we can do that, we'll make a lot of other mistakes, but thank God gives us that direction and the direction that we need. And so I'm thankful for that this weekend. It's been an exciting weekend, too. I got to go to a golf tournament yesterday, and uh, little did I know I would... Uh, be going with uh, Carson. So he, he looked at me, we were about to you know, get all our stuff on the golf carts, and he said, so, you know, do you want to drive, or do you know who's going to drive? And I know I felt like he wanted to, so I said, okay, yeah, you go ahead. And, uh, but I didn't know that his possible profession in life might be a NASCAR race driver. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we had a good time. We had a good time, though, so I have to contact my chiropractor this week. And let it all happen. <laughs> So, so, yeah, we've had a lot of fun. I hope that leading up to this Sunday, um, it's been a good week for you, uh, and us being able to gather together. What I'd like for us to do is, like we would normally do, um, just enter into a short prayer time, uh, where you are spending a little bit of time with the Lord before we continue in worship. Um, and what I would like for us to focus on, just being thankful, I think during this time it's easy for us to say, oh, wow, it's been a really difficult time. You know, thank you, God, for finally allowing us to gather together. Uh, but if I were to put together the collective experiences of the last three months, uh, my guess would be uh, we, could, we could talk for, for days about all the things that God has taught us through this time. So let's just be thankful right now. And I just want to remind us, uh, as uh, David Gray's not with us, uh, Esther, one of our faithful members, passed away during this time. And so we want to just keep him in prayer. Uh, and he decided to be away um, this Sunday. We understand. And I want to just remind us, as those who... Uh, maybe at higher risk are not here with us. Uh, we just need to be in prayer and not judgmental about being here or not being here, whether or not you make that choice. Uh, but specifically for David, uh, just to have the comfort that the Lord brings. We know he gives that in times of difficulty, especially now. Um, so let's go to the Lord in prayer for Thanksgiving uh, and specifically for David. Uh, join me, and then the worship team is going to start us in worship. Yeah.
it's um, just set up here. I think Megan shared something in our practice this morning in our rehearsal. Meg, what did you say about this first song, The Father's House? You said on your I follow worship. A worship leader Instagram account. He said, This is the song of this Sunday, Baptist Church Sunday. And I had already picked it. Yes. It's a great song. So it's the number one, number one song being sung <laughs> contemporary in church this, this week. So, um, The Father's House. We. It's obviously been a while since we've been here to sing this together, but we did at least once. Um, and then we'll sing a song that if you're able to watch the service online uh, a couple weeks ago, was it? Yeah. Uh, By the Grace of God, it's a newer song that we did once on video that we recorded one night. Uh, and we'll sing that second. So let's stand and sing praise today.
ourselves, our relationship with you, the things that we want um, in our lives that, that you've dealt with with us, and things we want to leave behind, and also the things that we've learned that we want to take moving forward. Um, 
thank you for each one here and those who can't be. God, again, it's not the building. Um, it's that big, the big C church and family um, and what unites us is in the building. But you, we thank you. We thank you for the message to come. Just just open our hearts. Bless it. Uh, bless us today with it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I feel like we've gone back in time to celebrate uh, being 200 years old the day after. So yesterday, our church turned 200 years old as an entity. And now uh, we get to meet in this place and our kids are here. And we love that sounds of little kids enjoying being here in the service. And I want to just uh, remind us um, that this building itself, when it was first built, didn't have extensions, didn't have parts of it where there were Sunday school classrooms and, and other breakouts. So everybody just met in this space. So I want to remind us of that while we're going through this. Uh, I love my daughters, I love the kids, the other kids that are here, and just remind us when you're here, we're going to keep going through the service. And so the uh, reminder I want to give us just for the church 200 years old uh, is this that there's a foundation. Uh, that was established. So if, if you remember from our church's history, the church is 200 years old. So in 1820, there were 16 people who got together in one of their members' homes, and they said, we think there's a need for the entity that we now know as First Baptist Church Elba. And we sit in this building because of that 200 years later. And so the church didn't go through, you know, not any difficulty. There was... You may have heard of it, a civil war that took place. Yes, the church was around during that time. We kind of think about it and we're going, wow, yeah. There was also a fire that destroyed the building. So on January 7th, in the evening of January 7th, in 1849, the church building that was in existence burned to the ground. And the membership, again, met faithfully in the ashes of that building the very next day and vowed to rebuild. And that's exactly what they did. And so now my question before we move into the main part of the message for us is just the future. What does that look like? You know, we put this up on the website just so people can see the history of the church and, and what we're doing right now. We're kind of constantly praying through that. I'm excited the direction that we're going and, and where God is taking us. And I want to just remind us, because I think as we walk through a time like this, there's a, a hesitancy or direction towards discouragement, isn't there? That we come back to this building for the first time in 14 weeks. And we think, God, what are you going to do during this time of uncertainty? And, oh, wow, if we looked at the history of the church and the things that they went through, it was far worse than anything like this. And so we have to remember in the context of history what God has done throughout all these things, throughout even the difficulties that this church faced in its history. Really a history that's not that long. It's long to us, 200 years old. But having a building that went through other epidemics, other pandemics, other things that, that could have caused the people to say, well, I mean, what is there left to do? Well, God has brought us back to this place for a reason, to carry out His ministry. And I'm excited about that. So today, we're going to be looking at this idea of legacy. <coughs> legacy. So this church obviously has a legacy. And we have to ask ourselves this question, what does it look like? What's the legacy for us going to look like? When we're gone, what will people say about this church and about God because of the ministry that we did here? And we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, so go ahead and turn there with me. And in this idea, I just want us to remember this one phrase, and it's actually in the text that we're going to look at. God is able to do far more. And I think we need that word right now because it's been weeks. And so we come back to this place and we say, God, what is that far more, right? What is that far more? And so we're in Ephesians. I want to just talk to us real quick about the background, okay? So we're in Ephesians. And anybody know the guy who wrote this? His name is Paul. He wrote a lot of the New Testament. And so I want to just point us in that direction that Paul was writing to a church that he was actually, uh, he actually cared a lot for. In fact, Ephesus was the place that he spent uh, more time than any other region. So he went to Ephesus and he cared for them a great deal, so much so that he sent his protege, Timothy, to be the pastor there. Now you can imagine someone that you maybe care about more than anyone else, and, and Timothy was like a son to Paul. And he said, I want to send you to a place that's going to need somebody who, who's going to be able to lead the people, and especially in an area like Ephesus, which was a, a, a cultural epicenter of idol worship, and trade, and so there were tons of different people coming through, and, and the gospel, you would think, would have a really, really hard time working here. But yet it did, 
and he puts Timothy in charge, and he says, I want you to take the gospel message to the people, and I want you to lead the church. And he wants to remind him, really the purpose of this message in uh, the entirety of the book of Ephesians, and Paul, from his Roman imprisonment, not really knowing what's going to happen, he sends to the church in Ephesus, with Timothy leading, and he says a few things. You need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, you need to be centered on the love of Christ, and you need to be centered on this glory that is given to God. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And that's our first point, a power by the Holy Spirit. That's going to be verses 14 through 16, and I just want to read 14 for us. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. And when I first read that, I thought, oh, there's a lot of reasons, especially now, for us to bow our knees to the Father. And so Paul says this, and he says, for this reason, and the reason is because in the verses that precede this, he's told them what the gospel is. He says, here is what your purpose is. He says at the beginning of chapter 3, for this reason I, Paul, prisoner for Christ Jesus, on the behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard the stewardship of God's grace was given to me for you. And then he talks about this mystery of the gospel, which has been given to us, and he says, for this reason... I bow my knee before the Father. Why do you ask, does God need help? Well, not necessarily, but he wants us to be a part of what he's doing. And so Paul is trying to help the church in Ephesus understand that you need to be a part of what's going on. And Paul, as he's sitting in this Roman imprisonment, he's, he said, with the way that he lived his life, I'm going to unapologetically share the gospel. When people ask me, what is this hope that you have? He shares that with him. All the way now that he's in Rome, and he's waiting to talk to the emperor. He's waiting to share the gospel with the emperor, because every other avenue, people can't find any fault in him. He said, okay, well, we're going to take you all the way to Caesar, and you're going to get to share with him. And so, Paul in this situation, he's gone through a lot of difficulty, right? And we've been 14 weeks, uh, we haven't been able to meet together, right? And that's been difficult for us. It's been heartbreaking. I don't want to deny any of those things where... And you see on the news and people who haven't been able to visit their loved ones, maybe in a nursing home, and, and for us, not being able to come together and see each other. We've done a lot of video stuff, and, and that's okay, but that's not us gathering, right? That's not us being here in this place. And so I'm thankful for that. And I know Paul, in the same situation, he longed to be with the church in Ephesus. And, he's, and he, he said to them with this heartfelt passion, for this reason, I bow the knee. And that leads into the rest of the text. And so in verse 15, it says, From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named from the Father. Now, I, I read this too. I thought, wow, God, that's great. I mean, we need to be on our knees for a lot of things. And, and when I read this, it, it just hit me. There's so much unrest. I mean, it's hard not to see, right? You turn on the television, that's where it is. It's pandemic, social unrest. Police shouldn't be here. We need a new world order. You know, all those th different things that you hear that will supposedly fix the problem of sinfulness, right? But the problem is yet we don't view each other rightly. And that we've all been created in God's image. From the Father, we've been given a name. And it's image bearers of God. And so really, us as the church, those shouldn't be issues for us. We should see that. We should have God in the world needs help. We need to see these things reconciled. Right? We need to see difficulty, social injustice, hate because of an ethnicity or not. Right? We need to see that and say, God, we need to reach out and be the change there. To say, we love everyone no matter what because they were created in God's image. And then verse 16, it says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now it says that he's given us this power. Now in the book of uh, Acts. We were going through that series in the fall. That was so exciting because we constantly got to see the power of the Holy Spirit. And wasn't that awesome? The word here for power is the dunamis. Sounds like a strange word. It's actually where we get a word for dynamite, which Greg knows a little bit about that, right? And so we get this word, and it's the word we get for uh, dynamite. And it says that we have this power through the Holy Spirit, which is given to us, which actually lives inside of us. But how does it live inside of us? Well, the text tells us it's this inner being. What does that mean? Well, the, the Greek, it's the, the eso anthropos, and it just means the inner man or the soul. And so this is actually only found two other places in the New Testament. I want to read these verses for you. It's in Romans 7, 22. It says this, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. 
In 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. And when I went to go visit uh, Esther for the last time, it was the Wednesday uh, night uh, before she passed away. And I was here just a few hours before. And uh, this <clears throat> verse came to my mind. I don't know why, but I, I just read it for them as I was kind of reading through my um, quiet time in other places. And, and it says, so we do not lose heart. Our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is renewed day by day until ultimately we are with the Father. And then we're renewed completely, right? I mean, what a, what a sweet thing to know that the ones that we love, that Esther herself is standing in the presence of God now. I mean, removed from all those ailments, and yet our outer self, and hers was, wasting away. This inner self is being renewed so that ultimately we sit with the Father. In Acts 1, this is actually the first passage that we read when I was here that says you'll receive power. It's that same word that doing lost when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. And we know from that study that that word witness is actually the literal word is a martyr, right? And for the early church, although we've been through what we call difficulty in a pandemic and not being able to gather together, when we compare that to the church in Acts, all the things that we saw, I really felt like God was preparing us for this. Uh, in the difficulty and the persecution, we kind of go, wow, God, we should be thankful for your grace. Always. Shouldn't we? No matter what. So God wants us to be this witness, right? He wants us to be empowered through the Holy Spirit. So it's not just about us, like, making things better, right? I, I don't know if you were sitting at home and, like, you got through, like, all of... Somebody put a post up. Christy told me. Somebody said, I watched all of Netflix. Now what do I do? Right? So, you, you, I mean, a lot of people were in that situation. Well, I'm not going to work. I'm okay. I'm watching things. Like, what else am I supposed to do? And the truth is that there was a lot of despair. I mean, a lot of people losing hope because everything that we had in our lives to distract us from the truth of God's Word and how it impacts our life, those things were taken away, right? For a short time, hopefully not to come back, but there's this constant reminder. People are wearing masks. I and mean, we did that as we were coming in. And it's this reminder that things can change at any time. But God wants us to point this, us in this direction that through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing that can take place that should shake you. And that actually leads us into our next point, centered on the love of Christ. So this idea of legacy, like, I mean, what kind of legacy do we want to leave? You just want to go about life, watch Netflix, then what do you do? Or do you want to live a life that's centered on Christ? Now we know that we have the power of the Holy Spirit, and God wants to do more than we can even think or imagine. And here in verse 17 it says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. So as we walk through this power of the Holy Spirit, and then we have this overflow of Christ in our hearts. So it's not just a matter of the Holy Spirit which gives us direction, but Christ himself is in our hearts. And so we have this, uh, this idea of being rooted. Now that sounds like a normal word to you, and you may think, that's probably, I mean, I've heard it used all the time. What's actually not used that much in the Bible? In fact, the Greek word is the rizuo, and, and it uh, really just means to be firm or established. And it's only found in one other place in the Bible. Now, I, I point out these things for us because when you see something that's not said a thousand times, it's usually important. And so here in Colossians 2, 7, it says, Rooted and built up in Him, established in faith, just as you are taught, abounding in thanksgiving. There's so many of these passages in, in this idea of being rooted or grounded in who God is and in Christ Jesus that it creates for us, this idea of who God really is in our lives, that He's unmovable, right? Man, how, how many other things have changed in the last three or four months, right? I, mean, I know we were sitting at four months ago, and, and, and God has done an amazing work here at the church. We've got the baptistry set up, we had a baptism here, and that was awesome. And then all of a sudden, this pandemic came out of nowhere, right? And, and everything changed, right? So, but where has our focus been? Has it been on Christ or has it been on something else? And so then verse 18 says, uh, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Have you been, I don't know, walking through uh, the midst of this time and wondering, God, what is your breadth? What is your length? What is your height? What is your depth? Maybe you've noticed a new depth, right? Maybe you've noticed a new height 
walking through this season and being able to say, God, in the last three months, I'm closer to you than I ever have been. And I hope that's the case, as just slowly the rest of the world has been pulled away. And certainly our hope in anything else has been pulled away. And in verse 19 it says, And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So having Christ in our lives, there's this idea that surpasses knowledge, right? When we first read that, we're kind of like, okay, well, what is that supposed to mean? Well, this idea of surpassing knowledge, the love of Christ, there's this understanding that we have from the world's perspective, right? That's in our minds. And actually, this word for knowledge is the uh, genosis, and it's where we get our word for, like, earthly knowledge. Uh, and in fact, um, if you uh, know anyone who says that they're a Gnostic, that's where they um, get this name, Gnostic. And basically... Um, what it means uh, for them is that God's, he's not perfect, right? Or he's um, unknowable. And for us, we know that's not the case. And so it says this love of Christ surpasses all knowledge. And I kept thinking about that. We were going through the midst of that, and somebody else would come on the TV and go, the numbers are up again. Right? Great. Anything good to report, right? No, you generally you turn on the news or you were during that time. There wasn't a whole lot. And so the media fixes on it. I just kept thinking about this, that the love of Christ surpasses our knowledge. And while the rest of the world says, man, things are spinning out of control, yet God has given us the reassurance of his word. He says, the love of Christ, no matter what else is going on, the, the genosis, the general um, mind, knowledge, the, the way that we generally perceive things, Christ's love surpasses all of that. And he gives us reassurance and hope. And so I, I think we get this idea from a few other places, and, and there's a, 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 another part of the text here that says, uh, be filled with all the fullness of God. And, and when I first read that, if you know um, what it means, it's just sort of like a completely filling up, right? I don't know if you've ever like um, completely filled up like a coffee cup, right? And you've seen that guy you know, in the office, he like, he puts all the way to the very top, and of course there's no, there's no tops, you know, wherever office you're at, if you know somebody who's done that, and, or in church, I don't get tops here, but so you know, hey, oh, there's no tops. Okay, well, I'm gonna fill it as full as I can get it, though. Still, right? I'm gonna walk back to my seat and like you know, you're, you're shaking. You know, don't spill it. Well, that's the idea. You want to get the most coffee that you can, right? Well, God gives us that complete fullness. Is what the text tells us in Himself, because we can't find it anywhere else, right? I mean, the rest of the world has over and over and over again over the last three months run out of the things that they thought filled them up. And they ran to the end and they were like, wow, I mean, it's only like maybe 1% full. What am I supposed to do with the rest of my life or the rest of however long this lasts? But the fullness, we you know, comes from God. I, I, uh, I remember somebody quoting this movie. I've never seen it, but uh, I think this phrase was made popular just in uh, relationships. Uh, there was a movie starring Tom Cruise uh, called Jerry Maguire. Now, in that movie, uh, there's his love interest, Renee Zellweger, and of course, you know, they're having the, the story that happens in every other love story, the back and forth, you love me, do you not? And in a pivotal scene in the movie, the Tom Cruise character says to his, his counterpart in the film, you complete me, right? Anybody who knows, you know, films like that, or romance films, typically they're kind of centered around that idea. And couple after couple and marriage relationships have been damaged because of that, because instead of finding their fullness in God, it's found in the other person, or they try to find it. So every person who heard that is like, you're going to complete me, you're going to complete me, you're going to complete me. But what the Bible says is that God gives us his fullness, and it only comes from him, right? So I ask you the question, where have you found your joy? Where have you found your hope during this time? Whatever else has been in my guess is that it may have let you down. And then we come to God, and we say, God, we want your fullness. Right? We've tried everything else. Certainly the rest of the world has. Hopefully we can take from their example. And so in this idea of legacy, I want to just remind us, it's kind of hard to fathom uh, that something, whatever it is, the world has been around for so long. And even a church, to be around for 200 years is fairly unheard of. Right? Now in the South, you really don't see this very often at all. And so when I, I remember when I first started talking uh, with Matt in the search committee, uh, we started talking about how the church was going to turn 200 years old, and, and, and you know, we started making you know, plans, and hey, this is going to be so awesome, the church is going to turn, turn, turn 200 years old, and how are we going to celebrate this, and, and oh, the things that God has taught us, right? 
we plan a celebration, and then God teaches us just how much we need to have His fullness in this time, right? And so, so not so much about a celebration for us in regards to reach out to the community, but a celebration for us in perspective, right? For us to be able to see, God, what do you want to do in our hearts? What do you want to do in our minds, in our lives? Maybe it's just to shake us up enough to say, God, what really matters? What's really most important? And so I want to close with this. It's that the glory goes to God, right? And we know that. We should be practicing that on a regular basis. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So to him who is able. Who is able? God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. And I thought it was, again, I thought it was interesting coming up to the 200-year celebration and uh, kind of things being put on hold. And I thought, God, what, what is going on? I mean, what are we going to get out of this time? But yet, God's taught us so much about being drawn close to Him, about having that power of the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ being centered in Him that really gives us that fullness that nothing else can, that there, nothing else in the rest of the world can. And this glory going to God the Father. How interesting is it that in this Ephesians passage that uh, I, I was working on months ago and, and coming back to it and working on this week, I thought, God, what a cool picture that you've showed us in your Trinity itself, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how they are all intertwined and teaching us something. And, and now we see that the glory in this passage goes to God because according to the power that has worked within us, the Holy Spirit working, to Him be the glory of the church. And in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. So, here's my question. I mean, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want the legacy of this church to be? For the little ones who don't understand it yet? Teenagers, as you try to figure out uh, what life holds, what you want to do with your life. But it was awesome. I got to um, hang out with Carson yesterday. So as we were, you know, speeding around the curves and things... <laughs> Uh, I, I asked him, hey, so you know, what are you going to do with your life? And you know, he talked about farming and doing those kind of things. I thought, that is so awesome. Just keep the race car driver thing in your back pocket because uh, you might need that. Um, but, but to know what you're going to do with the rest of your life and, and to hear God says to us that we have this power within us to carry out what he's given to us and the glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all generations. And it's not just our generation. I know we kind of think those who are leading right now um, me being the pastor and, and a great group of, of leadership that we have right now, it's about more than just us, right? Because we know we'll, we'll live a life, we'll be here for a certain duration of time, uh, we will die, and then who's going to come after us? Our kids and their kids. And so 200 years ago, I wonder if the people who were sitting in that house, 16 of them, uh, founding this church, thought about the people that would be here 200 years later. I don't know. Maybe they were. So for us... How do we have that perspective, right? So for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten generations, ten years from now, what will that look like? What purpose will they have? And I can guarantee you that the trajectory that we give now will make an impact on that. And I know that the people that started this church, that was their thought. And that's what our thought needs to be. And so I want to remind us, just as we're going to go into a video, just a reminder for us. On, and kind of how ripples are left and the things that we do. 200 years ago, the church was started. If it's here 200 years from now, to God be the glory. And what part do we play in that? So let's watch the video, and then we'll close. Everything leaves a mark. Every action produces an effect. A ripple that extends into the future. A forensic, I was here. Most people leave only the scraps of self. Empty rooms, faded photographs, dust and bones. They never wake up to the possibility that life is incomplete.
What will be the residue of your life? What evidence will future generations have of your existence? What will you leave behind? I've spent the last uh, probably six months or so um, talking with friends and, and family members, just kind of asking them, you know, what, what does it look like? What does your faith lineage look like? And uh, I'm just reminded uh, of all the faith blessings that we have, my family, uh, having those who have come before us who uh, have sought God, who have uh, looked for direction from Him. And I think even more now in this time, there's going to be a group of people. There's going to be your kids now. There's going to be those that are going to be their kids that are going to come and say, remember when that happened? Remember when that thing happened, that pandemic, and, and, and how did they respond? Your kids watch now, and they take cues on how they'll live the rest of their life. And so uh, this legacy that we've been given, I wonder what it will look like. And are we going to have the right trajectory? And that God is able to do far more, even now, as we think about what that's going to look like moving forward. And so I want to remind you, maybe you're here today, and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Um, it's as easy, easy as this, and I thought Jesus did a great job last week when we had our children's Sunday. you got to admit you're a sinner, right? Everybody makes mistakes. I know I do. Being believed in Jesus is God's son, that he, he died on the cross for our sins, and he lived that sinless life so that we didn't have to. He was raised on the third day. And the scripture tells us that if we confess that with our mouths, he's the Lord of our life, then we'll be saved. And so if you've never made that decision, I'd love to talk to you about that afterwards uh, and just share with you that hope and the message of the gospel. That's what it is. And so what I want to do for us um, is just pray for us. And just a reminder before we close, uh, there is going to be some special treats. We're kind of calling it the Father's Day, a sweet treat to go. So as you believe, there's going to be something on the table out there, uh, courtesy of Olson family. And so uh, please take that and enjoy that with your family, as well as uh, a few discussion questions. Um, something that I have been thinking about and I talked with Christy about and you know, we really would like to give something as you guys leave. I know we've been having like these sweet family times at home, right? I'm just being able to study God's Word together and answer those questions. There's going to be a few in the bulletin, um, and I'm going to do that for the foreseeable future. Just as you have lunch, uh, or you, wherever you're going, whatever you're going to do, take a few minutes, maybe it's just in the car ride on the way home, uh, to ask those questions. Uh, I promise you'd have some good dialogue, okay? Uh, let me pray for you, and then we'll close them. Father, we uh, thank you for your Word. God, our words are not sufficient uh, to give us life, uh, to produce um, joyfulness. God, to produce the fullness that you give us. Um, God, let us be reminded that especially coming out of a time like this, we need to have um, an abundance of thankfulness. Um, God, we're not worthy of any of the blessings that you give us. Uh, God, we are thankful that you looked on us, um, sinners in need of grace, and gave that to us freely, joyfully. God, that you allow us to be a part of your family. We're so thankful for. Um, God, I want to pray especially for uh, the dads that are here today. Um, God, we know being a dad is not an easy thing. But God, you've given us the perfect example in yourself. A perfect father who never makes mistakes. And God, I just pray that we can lean on your grace as we try to do our best. Uh, God, that more than that, that we would be powered by the Holy Spirit. That we would be centered on your son, Jesus. And that we would give you all the glory and the honor as we try and serve you our best. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Love you, church family. Uh, make sure you grab that sweet treat on the way out. Have a good Sunday.